Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is Trump's Conviction Felon, an Inflection Point in History. Well, if you recall back in the day when uh, 2020, when Donald Trump lost the election, he created the big lie. And what was the big lie? Big lie 1.0 was he said the election was from him. The election, the election was rigged. Well, let's fast forward to this week. Uh, Donald Trump has the, uh, the title, a historic title, of being a convicted felon of 34 counts, 34 indictments for President 45. And what does that mean? Well, it means that he's now gone into the big lie 2.0. And what is that lie? Is that his conviction was rigged, that the justice system is rigged, the judge is tainted, the district attorney was rigged, the jury was not fairly selected. Uh, not only is it Donald Trump's words, but worse yet, all his loyal surrogates, all his loyal lackeys have also joined it into the social media and airwaves, basically parody <clears throat> what Donald Trump has said. This is dangerous for democracy. And to discuss this, I'd like to welcome my co-host, Jay Fidel, my special esteemed guest, Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and our other special esteemed guest, as always, Chuck Crumpton. Good morning, everyone. It's been a week now since the 34 uh, verdicts, count, uh, the count and the verdict of guilty has uh, made history in this country. Give me your impression of what has transpired since that guilty verdict has come down. Trump is on a full court press to deny it. Uh, what he was saying when he was subject to the gag order before, he's, he's accelerated that by multiples. And he's gotten all his friends in the um, MAGA GOP to join him in the effort. They are trying to destroy the system. Um, I, nothing new about that, except that he's accelerated it right now. But the fact is, he's a convicted felon. And the speculation in the press is, well, there are some people that say um, that uh, you know, that nothing. the convictions have nothing to do with his position uh, in the election. Others say no, don't you don't don't make that assumption. Maybe it does have something to do, and um, you know the the bottom line is um, you know we don't know we don't know. He claims to have raised seventy million dollars uh, right after the convictions. I doubt that. I I doubt that. Just as I doubt Hamas uh, Ministry of Health numbers for the people in Gaza. Um, but I want to tell you a story. Can I tell you guys a story? Okay, my wife and I like to watch Australian TV. And Australian TV includes these really fabulous shows about Australian immigration and customs. If you haven't seen that on YouTube, you really have to. Well, last night, there was one that was really interesting. It was about a guy who came from South Africa to Australia and sought entry. And he had lied on his um, you know, airplane entry form. It said, have you ever been convicted of a crime? And he said no, <laughs> when in fact they found out that he had been convicted of a crime <laughs> and they barred him from entry or at least considered it. And suffice to say, there are airport entry forms all over the world where they ask you questions like that. <laughs> and, Trump, <laughs> and Trump will have to answer yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, guess what, Chuck? That leads me to a question. And that question is the following. Do we now remove all questions on employment applications, rental applications, professional certifications about have you ever been convicted of a felony? Is it now fair or just to leave those questions on the forms when Donald Trump is, is not only running for office, but may well be the 47th president if things continue on this pathway. Well, uh, your thoughts on, on whether it's just or not to ask those questions on all these type of forms? I think what's changed is <clears throat> now you can't ask the question without including the follow-up question. Uh, if so, have you received assurance of a MAGA pardon? Well, <laughs> I don't know if there's enough room on the forms for all these questions, but that's a good one. Um, all seriousness, Chuck, um, to what degree is Donald Trump and his surrogates, um, the MAGA, the MAGA followers that are, um, housed in Congress, Speaker Johnson 
has promised retribution against the Department of Justice. He's threatening funding. So the question is, to what degree are they making headway in the last week? If you're a one-trick pony, as Trump and his followers are, and your only trick is bullying, at some point, you're going to reach a point when people get freaking tired of that. Okay, there's no substance to it. There's no truth to it. There's no moral value to it. There's no human responsibility to it. And at some point, it's not entertaining anymore. It's not galvanizing anymore. And while I don't believe in polls, they've been proven inaccurate in 2020 and 2022. No, there's still, there is one that suggests that independent voters, as many as half of them, are saying, we're not going to vote for a convicted felon. This is a deal breaker for us. And I go back to my image. An individual of whatever age, background, personality, whatever, goes into a voting booth all by herself or himself. And they're confronted with a choice. And they make a choice. And maybe they think it makes a difference. Maybe they don't. Maybe they think that at least this is an opportunity to speak for themselves, whether anybody notices it or a drop of rain in an ocean. But maybe a few of those people, maybe just enough of those people go in there and say, this is my vote. I'm going to exercise it the way I believe is right. That, I believe, will be the difference in 2024. Fingers crossed. Cynthia, your impressions of what has transpired since May the 30th, the date of uh, the convictions were were announced by the judge. Uh, give me your thoughts. I hear a lot about um, a bloodbath, a riot, a civil war, uh, all these, and it's always the same threat, and it's been the same threat since, what, 2016. Um, but there are no protests. There are no riots. There is no civil war. What we see is limited MAGA people going after individuals and their families, the judges, Michael Cohen, uh, Stormy Daniels, the, the witnesses, everybody, not just that they're complaining that, oh, they're, um, they're crooked, they're, you know, it was all a hoax, it was all a setup. Um, th that's what they're doing. He's giving them these people, and then they're going after them the doxing of the families and the children, even the young kids, their grammar schools, what school they go to. That's where I start going, wait a minute. And so all this, you know, if there was this huge mega fraternity, so to speak, where are they? They're out there doing sleazy little sneaky moves, trying to um, threaten people. And in threatening people, individuals, they, they undermine our judicial system by making people afraid, right? Let me go to my, Speaker Mike Johnson. Um, okay. He hasn't been sneaking around. He's on every airwave he can get his mouth to the microphone on. And that is he's threatening the Department of Justice and other federal institutions about withholding funding uh, and or worse, uh, potential committee investigations. So that's not necessarily sneaking around. That's that's an overt threat and or promise. Your thoughts? One chilling thing that I heard on the news this morning, um, Jesse Waters was interviewing Stephen Miller, mm -hmm. and he is calling on all of the Republican state legislatures to step in and start making preparations for taking over the electoral system in their state. And that is something you guys know, I've been talking about this for 
I don't know, three, four years now. Um, and that's what worries me the most. It's not the voters. I think that he is a slam dunk. Trump is going to lose. No problem with the citizenry. But what about the legislatures that can cheat? We know he's going to cheat, and he's going to cheat again. But how? And how do we find out and take steps to stop that from happening? The Democrats are being too nice. And when I heard Biden say he's not going to use this conviction as a, you know, campaign stump, I thought, what? That is so important for people to hear about, talk about. And we need to shine a bright light on people like Speaker Johnson, who should be being impeached right now, um, at the very least sanctioned to, to be just throwing out all these false accusations that have no basis and no foundation. Jay, you know, many years ago, you and I would use the phrase, Donald Trump is pulling the wings out of the Constitution. Well, let's, let's amend that. It appears that Donald Trump is pulling the wings out of every branch of government, Congress, the executive office, and now the Department of Justice or the justice system. Uh, how far does this go? How far does he get away with this? And to what, to what ends does this stop? Is it simply he's not reelected as the 47th president? Or does this continue well after, in your opinion? Well, first, some, some thoughts. I, among us, if you don't mind, Tim, I'd like to make a motion to sanction uh, Mike Johnson. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, OK. Th thank you, Chuck. You hesitated. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to determine whether to raise all five digits or only one. <laughs> I'm afraid that the country has, has turned. You know, you like to think that as members of the species, we can kind of figure out and understand, if not agree with, the views expressed by some other member of the species. But, you know, we here have been trying to figure out what drives the MAGAs, what drives the GOP, what drives these acolytes, the way they come up with these things. Um, and it's very hard to do that. It's very hard to put your head into their head and understand their rationale. It's, it's inexplicable. It's outrageously inexplicable. <clears throat> On the other hand, I would like to say that I, I have some hope. I know you don't hear from me on that very often, but uh, I do have some hope. I think it's like this, the stock market uh, uh, you know, phenomenon that I talk about. It goes up until it gets tired of going up, then it goes down. It stays down until it gets tired of being down. <clears throat> and I think people in general around the country who used to support Trump, who have supported Trump, who may be supporting Trump even now, today, are going to get tired of this because it, <clears throat> the little pieces of reality are going to creep through. Um, and because they're going to get just bloody tired of it. And so the, it, it's like um, on, a, on an X, Y axis curve. I mean, what goes faster? This fatigue thing I'm talking about or the propaganda thing that Trump is trying to achieve? He's working every day and every night. He's on a roll now. This is more effort than he's ever put in, even back in 2020, um, to try to bust the government. Uh, and he's doing it. He's doing it. Of course, we we predicted this. He's doing it to change the subject. Correct. He's doing it to avoid, you know, the full impact of his convictions. Um, and so that, you know, that's his motivation. But I think maybe he's going too far. But the other problem is something you guys just touched on, and that is. Yes, people are tired of this. Yes, they they will take his convictions seriously. Yes, they will vote against him. But in this country, with Trump doing his machinations and his efforts to undermine the government everywhere, okay, we cannot assume that the popular vote or even the electoral vote against him will stand because he is trying to destroy the country. He's trying to destroy the popular vote and the, by way of propaganda. Um, and the electoral vote by way of machinations in the state houses, as he did last time, that playbook is still open. 
So, you, you know, you can't say, oh, people will understand. Oh, they will not, um, you know, they will not give him credit. They will, they will hold it against him that he was convicted. <clears throat> sure, fine. And the popular vote may re reflect that. But he is going to try to manipulate the result at every level, not just some levels, but at every level. The guy is crazy as a bedbug, and this is what he's doing. So be careful to say that everyone will vote against him. It will have to be a huge landslide against him. Um, and the state houses have to resist this, this is what he's selling about changing the electoral vote. Um, uh, and, and that may or may not work. We may wind up with him, whether people vote for him or not. And if we wind up for him with him, that, you know, that is going to be a different world. It was an article uh, in, I think, the Washington Post recently. What happens? It's terrifying to know what happens when Trump, as and when Trump wins this election, gets back into the White House. It will be terrifying. And uh, what I'm saying, though, is that uh, without having a landslide against him, um, he is going to try all these machinations, and it is of great concern because because there are enough, and this is to answer your question, there are enough people in this country who will back him on that. There are enough people in the MAGA crowd who will trot out their Second Amendment guns to make a difference in the streets. There are enough people to have another insurrection. Chuck, you know something about the legal industry. You've been a part of it for most of your professional career. Uh, describe to me the effectiveness of his attacks against the judges, the district attorney. Um, he, he makes uh, implied comments about the jury. There's still a gag order in effect, I understand. Uh, the prosecutor, uh, Bragg, is trying to keep that in place until after sentencing. But describe to me, in your words, the the impact of the damage he's producing against the justice system and more importantly does this have an impact on the other indictments that are pending that are not come to trial yet it's a really good question it's expansive enough that we could spend several of these sessions on it um but there's some key points that really deserve focus and clarity one is that this is a state court conviction. Neither he nor any federal court can pardon him or exonerate him for this. He's in the state court system. Second, whatever people may think, one thing we all know is this was a jury of peers, men and women, different ethnic groups, selected by agreement of Trump's and his lawyers and the prosecution and its lawyers. <clears throat> Third, we know that the only legal avenue that Trump's lawyers have raised as what they believe will generate a successful appeal is the allowance of Stormy Daniels getting into details of the sexual activities with Trump. However, under the law, once Trump denied that it ever happened, the one legal basis for refutation is a detailed accounting of exactly what did happen. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, for example, if there is an auto accident, eh, and the driver who gets sued said, hey, I never touched him. I never hit him. I slammed on my brakes. I stopped a few inches short. Hey, of course, that's going to enable the people on the other side to say, here are the photos of the bumper. Hey, here is what got knocked out of the seats inside the car. Here's the seat bag that deployed. Once you deny an event, the other side is entitled to present a detailed accounting of that event because ultimately that's a question of fact for the jury.
It is not a question of law. Okay, let me ask you this. Um, he was convicted on federal, federal charges. Does this have any chance of getting in front of the Supreme Court, the, the, the United States Supreme Court? The charges that he is convicted of are state court charges. It doesn't go to a federal court. There is not a constitutional issue that has been raised here, a federal constitutional issue, such as, for example, he did not receive the effective assistance of counsel. Okay, that's a U.S. constitutional issue. That could go up, but that's not raised here. It's not presented. The last thing, Todd Blanche, and it should be probably pronounced Blanche because any of us probably would in the legal system at what he tried to do and get away with in that case. But <laughs> what he's argued is <clears throat> not, Blanche has not said the judge was rigged. Blanche has not said the jury was rigged. He cannot. If he had grounds to disqualify that judge, he could have raised them. And the ones that he did to say that the gag orders and the sanction orders against Trump demonstrated bias on the part of the judge, those are rejected. Those will go nowhere on appeal. <clears throat> those are throwaways. Throw it at the wall, see if it sticks. <clears throat> he will attack the allowance of Stormy Daniels' testimony. But in this case, you not only have Trump denying that it ever happened, he denied it by non-testimonial innuendo. He offered absolutely no evidence that it did not happen. In fact, when his lawyers attempted to show that the conversations between Cohen and Trump's guys and Trump did not happen because that was about a different subject, it backfired on them because their key witness got up there, alienated the judge, argued with the judge, and came within inches of getting sanctioned for contempt of court. Look at the jury's verdict. Less than two days, 10 hours of deliberations. That is fast. All 34 counts, that's unheard of. And if ever there was a verdict that made a choice between the credibility of Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels and the credibility of Trump and Costello, who would put a Costello on a witness stand? Maybe Abbott. But the credibility contest lost. The basis for appeal of the factual findings of the jury on all 34 counts is absent. There is no factual basis to refute their findings as to the credibility of the prosecution witnesses and the defense witnesses. Is there an error of law in letting Stormy Daniels say too much? Even the judge said, it's not my job to object, but you surely, you, you surely should think about it. So yeah, um, point well made. Yeah, point well made. Yes, excellent points. Cynthia, um, Charlie Stikes, who's a commentator, a radio personality, um, used this terminology, the cheerleaders for vengeance which is to say all the guys that showed up in the red ties at the trial are now on the airwaves. Um, and I, we've already mentioned Speaker Johnson, but uh, a gaggle of them are on the airwaves uh, asking, seeking retribution. Uh, as of this morning, I believe Donald Trump, or it was uh, aired yesterday, Donald Trump is going back after Hillary Clinton, uh, suggesting that maybe it's a good time to revisit her, uh, her involvement in things or his alleged, you know, statements that she maybe should go to jail again. So we're back on this revenge campaign. To what degree is that dangerous? And maybe you've already answered it, but um, let me get it from this angle. What impacts does this have as we move forward to the election? But worse yet, uh, as far as tarnishing the office of President of the United States to have this kind of conduct, this kind of words. Uh, have we lost character of the President of the United States? Is it forever, forever tarnished? And is it going to be forgotten? Do we, we start fresh again someday? 
I don't think this will ever be forgotten. I think it will be taught in history classes forever because um, it's such a huge inflection point. Um, one of the things we're seeing is that um, some of the two, two that I know of for sure, um, people that were involved in the fake electors, they were fake electors. They've already uh, been indicted. They haven't been tried yet. And they're, they've are they been voted to go to the RNC, the big um, convention. They are going to be representatives, these people. What we see is the Republicans turning criminals into heroes. And that we've seen, and then heroes into criminals. Um, you know, Liz Cheney is a great example of that. So how do we sw switch that back around? No, he did it in four years, but we got to remember he didn't do it by himself. He had a lot of help from Russia, a lot of help from social media, false posts that are happening again now. And I think that's an important thing to, to think about and remember. Anything our federal agencies can do about it, particularly if they're using social media, uh, Meta, X, as um, allowing this kind of propaganda to work its way back into the 2024 election. I don't think it's working. I think it's already worked. I think it's already happened. They say they're going to go against it, but and they, what can they do exactly? Um, you know, and I'm sure they're trying to get rid of all the fake um, accounts and things like that. But you know, how how do you find them? How do you get rid of them? So it's so much bigger than all of that. One of the most disturbing things I watched yesterday was on C-SPAN when they're um, just grilling the um, you know the attorney general, Merrick Garland is sitting there. And of all things, we got Jim Jordan sitting up there trying to come at him that he should be sanctioned. He should be, you know, um, impeached. He should, all these things that has to happen to him because he has denied a subpoena. They just want the, and it's kind of stupid. They just want to have the the video clip instead of just the transcript of hers uh, interview of Biden. Well, it seemed so ridiculously hypocritical for Jim Jordan to be saying all these things when he is in the same right now. He has done the same thing, right? He has not answered the subpoena. He has not come forward. He's in violation of the subpoena. And then he's trying to throw that same charge at the attorney general. And I was just sort of in shock as I watched all of the Republicans, you know, and all of the main ones that we know about Gates and Biggs and all those guys. But they're, they're talking about this as if the chairman of the committee is not in the same violation. It's all Democrats. It's all, you know, it's only the Democrats that are doing this. I, I was just like, mm -hmm. how can this even be judged as a legitimate committee? And it's the, you know, judicial committee. So it's pretty important. Yet this is the farce that we've got going on in Congress. So what are we gonna do about that when we've got all of Congress, well, the Republicans anyway, all of the Republicans in Congress are willing to just lie. They're willing to cheat. They have sacrificed their integrity in order to get what they want. And that to me is unconscionable. Jay, more or less the same question to you. To what degree um, can this overt propaganda, this revenge tour, to what degree can it be um, not foiled, but uh, somewhat uh, with some oversight, particularly on social media, are there any tools that you can think of that uh, the administration implement to stop the, uh, basically the manipulation of, of, of accounts, bots, and other tools on social media? There's Think Tech Hawaii. Uh I, I mean to expand that to the notion of, of the media in general. You know, what, what I get here is that there, this is one hand clapping. 
Um, this is Mike Johnson and his friends with the Red Ties uh, in a co combined, coordinated effort to confuse the public, to change the subject. All of this is about changing the subject instead of focusing on what happened and will happen with Trump. Um, so, you know, I, th I think it goes to the media, which is your favorite subject, Tim. Um, you, know, you know, the people have to speak out against this. There should be a, you know, huge statement by everyone and anyone to say, this is all crazy. We cannot accept what they're doing. And that should be think tech and the likes of think tech. It should be on social media actively. The government should be on social media. The president, the DOJ should be on social media. The FBI should be on social media, um, you know, making the other case. Is and he getting a pass? Is he getting a pass from uh, social media? Is he getting a pass from the major networks? Um... Well, the major networks are not, they're covering him raw meat. They're covering Trump uh, as he tries to excite his base. And and they are they're complicit. If you want my opinion, they're complicit in allowing him to suck the oxygen and take the stage. Mm -hmm. um, and they have got to really pound on the realities here, not not the um, the insanity going on uh, in in the hearing against uh, against the AG. And I also want to mention, uh, Chuck, it's it's not just a matter of law. You know, there you are, there you go again, talking about what, what could have, should have happened in that trial. Um, and and there we go again, talking about, you know, the, the, the facts, the realities in, in our own little echo chamber. The fact is that Trump is busy at 11 o'clock at night trying to sub subvert and suborn people and threaten them all over, in every way, on every issue. Now, just remember that when uh, uh, Trump uh, was uh, ordered to pay $455 million, um, and the law clearly requires him to put up a bond in that amount if he wants to avoid execution of that judgment, um, the appellate division in New York, the uh, appeals court just above that trial court, said, no, 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 he doesn't have to put up $455 million. He can put up $175 million. Where did they get that from? There are no reasons for it. Nobody knows where they got that from. This is in New York, the same state which just convicted him. Um, so I am very concerned about appellate courts. They can come up with some real strange deals. And um, likewise, Chuck, I'm concerned about federal courts. You get a judge like Eileen Cannon, She'll find a due process violation. One one um, you know columnist wrote to say, how can you have thirty four uh, counts and convictions? Um, uh, isn't that duplication? Isn't that a wrongful attempt to uh, uh, fragment the charges? Well, in my opinion, no. He signed thirty four phony documents. That's thirty four charges. Um, but the argument is out there. And some people feel that um, 34 is too many. Uh, conceivably, that's a due process issue. Conceivably, it's going to go to a federal court. Conceivably, you're going to get a, a you know a judge that's kind of corrupted over him, uh, an Eileen Cannon judge. Uh, and there you go. And it's on the way to the Supreme Court, and everything is uh, stuck in amber between now and November. So, you know, our analysis of, of the validity of those uh, indictments um, may not stick, I'm sorry to say. But what we, the media, have to do is we have to we have to call them out, call them out on every lie, on every manipulation, on every effort to change the subject. And we should do that here. We're pressed for time, so I'm going to go around the table and ask for your final thoughts on this topic. Uh, Chuck, I'll start with you. Two things. I mean, one, I'm going to go back to your question, because... I think there's only one response, not reaction, response, to the barrage of lies, bullying, threats that are the one-trick pony approach of Trump, the media, the allies, that whole bunch. They're indistinguishable. They're fungible. All right. The response is, if I were to design it, I would get 30 to 60 second testimonials from normal, ordinary people of all 
backgrounds and types and just get them to tell you their story in 30 to 60 seconds, the difference that the choice that is not offered by Trump and the mega GOP, but is offered by Biden and the Democratic approach, the difference in their lives that those choices make, the health care difference, the education difference, the housing difference, the quality of life difference, the governance and voting difference in every sector of society. Just tell the story in 30 to 60 seconds. This is how my life is different and better because that choice is available. We now will go into that polling booth all by ourselves and decide whether we want that choice to still be available to make a difference in our lives. I know that the DNC watches Think Tech Hawaii, so please keep your phone handy and close by so when they call you this afternoon, you'll volunteer your services. <laughs> Cynthia, would you please uh, sum up what uh, your thoughts are pertaining the 34 convic uh, convictions for Donald Trump? Lawrence O'Donnell, he's a, a MSNBC host. Correct. Okay, this is what he wrote, and it's so good that I just I couldn't resist. He says, here's my take on the trial. He sits in a room of broken lives, haunted by schemes and cheated wives, old and cold and mad as hell. He can sit and glare, but cannot yell. He folds himself into a shrunken pose, too old and feeble to stop the doze. He hates the judge and he hates the case and he hates the rules that keep him in place. The fat frumpy golfer is a weak old man with weird fake hair and a deep fake tan. He's desperate and angry and doesn't sleep well, so he rants in the hall like a clanging bell. He just wants love and approval and power, but his style is dishonest and toxic and sour. The despots and strong men play him the fool. They laugh and point at the Helsinki tool. He lusts for his daughter, his wife's not a fan, of the dishonest and repugnant bully baby man. So he sits alone in the cold, as they repeat his lies in his baggy blue suit and his long, long ties. Smaller and smaller, the old man appears, powerless and silent, steeped in fears. His money and title and self-made fame are now a poison, a poison with his name. That certainly uh, trumps any limerick I had come up with in the last eight years. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. That was, um, I didn't know Lawrence O'Donnell wrote like that. Neither Appreciate that. But when I read it, I thought, oh, boy, this well, we, is, I know what I'm going to share. I know what my quote is today. All right. Well, we do now. Uh, Jay, it's hard to follow that one, but uh, your last thoughts, and you get the final word. You know, Franz Kafka is becoming popular again. And uh, I think one of the reasons why is that, uh, you know, he talks about the absurd. And uh, we, we are living in a world of absurdity where it is possible that a demagogue of, of this dimension could, could actually be president again and wreck all the havoc he has threatened in public. Um, and it, my, my last word, my last thought is that what the electorate does, what the system does, however damaged it may be, is a statement of these United States. It's a statement of who we really are and where we're really going. And it is of great concern to me there was an article in the paper recently about how the uh, the liberal countries, the Western countries in Europe, are making plans for the re-election, the re-emergence of Trump. And um, I think that is as chilling as anything I've heard. Thank you very much. We've run out of time. I'd like to thank my co-host, Jay Fidel, my special guests, Cynthia Lee Sinclair, Chuck Crumpton. Thank you for your attendance and your wise, sage thoughts in this program. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host for America Issues, take one. Join us next week, and until then, aloha.